So I know I skipped John 5, but this will be uh, something that's connected. So in John 5, last time we saw John 6 with feeding of the 5,000 walking on the sea. And I explained that. And then the bread from heaven is going to come up. But so just real quick in John 5, uh, just, you know, 37 ish. And the father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him you do not believe. And then 39 is what, where I want to get into. So Jesus is speaking to the Jews. Usually Jews in authority and stuff, religious authority and such. You search the scriptures. Look at this. You search the scriptures, the Bible. For in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify about me. Now this whole section here, starting in verse 31, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. The whole context, the whole uh, topic here is witness, testimony. Now we know witness, testimony, the whole thing of many times with crimes and certain cases, uh, accidents, there's witness. Oh, I bear witness. I was there. Somebody testifies. They bear witness of something. I saw the crime etc and today we have cameras and all kinds of stuff but especially before that time witness is huge because think about that i mean think about a context i know this is pretty far from our context but a time where there's no such thing as recording voices there's no such thing as cameras what do you go with well you, you can go with certain documents in certain situations of you know people signed a document whatever but Many times, witnesses are a huge, huge factor, a huge thing, huge, big deal. And in the law, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, you had, uh, you shall not like receive an accusation except on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Like there's that kind of thing. Because that whole issue is a big deal. And Jesus is going to that topic of witness. And he interestingly says, first of all, the father testifies about me. He's my witness. That's amazing, isn't it? About who I am. He will witness about me. Because the whole, in all the Gospels, the main core issue is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Even till this day, that's a core issue. Who is this Jesus? Why do these people throw out Jesus' name like this? He must be something. Hmm. Who is this Jesus? Well, uh, Jesus is saying, the Father, God, testifies about me. Now, that's a big witness, <laughs> if God testifies about you. But then, 39, you search the Bible, you search your Bibles, for in them you think you have everlasting life. But that Bible itself, look at this, the Bible itself testifies about me. This is so goosebump giving. Incredible. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. 41. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the one from the only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you hope. Okay, Moses, um, do you know who was regarded, uh, who was most esteemed by the Jews? So when we look at the Old Testament, there were lots of, you know, I mean, we can recall a lot of very important individuals, right, in the Bible. People will bring up Adam, people will bring up now, the positive side, people will bring up David, people will bring up Moses, people will bring up Abraham, etc. But Moses was the one that was regarded as like the most important person by Jews, most highly regarded. Because, I mean, Moses led the whole nation and all, all that stuff. Well, amazingly, Jesus says, 45, don't think that I shall accuse you guys to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you hope. Now, this would have been absolutely shocking. This would have been absolutely like almost blasphemous and shocking and ridiculous and etc. How can you say that? What do you mean Moses accuses us? 46. 
For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. Remember verse 39? You search your scriptures, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have everlasting life. And these are they which testify about me. The very Bible that you so cling to points to me. And here in verse verse 45, 6, verse 46, if you believe Moses, basically Moses is writing, because Moses wrote, and it, I mean, they never met Moses, but you believe Moses in the sense of you, you write about, you believe what he wrote. Well, if you actually believe Moses is writing, you would believe me, because he wrote about me. But if you don't believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So this is where this comes in. This is fascinating. Jesus is saying, Moses wrote about me. And as I showed you last time, remember the feeding of the 5,000? Jesus is the greater Elijah, greater Elisha. I showed you that. They, Elisha fed with 20 loaves, 100 men. Jesus takes five loaves and feeds not 500, not a thousand, 5,000 just men plus 15,000 other, so about 20,000 people. Jesus walks on the water. He is the greater one. This is just so essential, so huge. Now, 622, on the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except one and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples but his disciples had gone away alone however other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks remember I pointed this out last time that John says this he interestingly brings it up again because it's kind of it's important 24 when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there nor his disciples they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life which the son of man will give you because god the father has set his seal on him so 26 this is pretty huge especially i mean actually in our context today is quite huge most assuredly i say to you you guys are seeking me not because you saw the signs but because you ate of the loaves and were filled so See, this is tied to uh, prosperity garbage. And it's called prosperity gospel, but I usually don't like to call it that. It's prosperity garbage. The whole thing of if you come to Jesus, you can get your best life now. You can get all these riches and nice things. So come to Jesus. There are these ministers of the devil that attract people to their quote unquote church or their ministry by selling Jesus this way. If you get Jesus, you can get all, get all these nice things. This is in Africa, this is in America, this is all over. These people were seeking Jesus because of the physical filling, not because of the really important reason that's connected to eternal life, salvation and eternal life. Do you see how it's relevant in that kind of way? And he has to tell them to not work for the food which perishes, the physical food, because they, they just had the, their fill, you know, 5,000 souls with barley bread and fish and stuff. Don't work the food which perishes, but this other food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. So then they're wondering now, okay, 28. They said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. This is the key thing. This is the key, quote-unquote, work that you need to do. Believe in the one that he sent. Of course, himself. So then 30, 
Well then, um, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? Now what's kind of almost strange is Jesus just did the feeding of the 5,000. But many times people, uh, they tend to ask or they tend to demand supernatural signs. If we see some miracle, if we see some supernatural thing, then we'll believe. Sometimes you meet uh, unbelievers that demand some kind of sign, some kind of supernatural miracle. Oh, if, you know, some miracle, then I'll believe. But, uh, yeah, so what sign will you perform then? Um, what work will you do? 31, our fathers, our ancestors, ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So there was this, uh, there was this thing in the Jewish, like, tradition and thought that when the Messiah comes, that he's gonna, like, give bread or something like that. So a popular Jewish um, expectation was that when the Messiah came, God would once again feed his people with manna. So there was that kind of popular belief. But um, so remember the context where they just were fed this barley bread, 5,000 people getting fed. And so that did get them to think, oh, may maybe this is the Messiah. Remember, they wanted to make him king. But then they de they're demanding more signs. And then uh, they're going into the whole thing of, oh, the bread thing, oh, the manna in the desert. Because remember, Israel, 40 years in the wilderness, God provided manna daily, except the Sabbath day. So they go into that. And then 32, then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you guys the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So remember how uh, in chapter four with the Samaritan woman, remember how Jesus went into, if you knew who I was, you would ask him and he will give you like living water. Remember that? The whole physical, spiritual, Jesus says something and it's taken as a physical, but Jesus is speaking spiritually. Remember that whole issue? Well, here we see the same thing. Jesus takes the physical, the natural, and he's communicating the spiritual. So obviously Jesus is not literal bread, but um, Jesus is saying, I am the bread of God that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. It's absolutely just amazing. Just like manna came down from heaven now, manna was not exactly bread, but I think it was maybe kind of similar. Just like uh, daily bread came down from heaven by God and gave life to his people, God sent his one and only son, the life-giving bread, so that people may eat him and have life. Do you see that amazing parallel? 34, then they said to him, Lord, Give us this bread always, or all the time. Remember, just like the Samaritan woman who said, Oh, give me that water then. Give me that water so I don't have to come here. They say the same kind of thing. Give us this bread always. 35, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and you don't believe. All that the Father gives will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Like, I will by no means, like, shoo away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me. That of all that he, the Father, has given me, I should lose nothing, but I should raise it up at the last day. So the resurrection comes up again. For this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Then uh, the, the Jews then complained about him because he said, I am bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? So we know God the Father from heaven sent his son, but we know that it doesn't mean that he flew down to the earth or something. 
It was the Holy Spirit supernatural conception of the Virgin, and Christ was born into the world. So in a way, he was naturally, truly naturally born like any other human being, because he's truly 100% man. But there is also the truth that God sent him from heaven. Both are true. So they're kind of, um, with, with the, uh, the natural background they have, they know that this is this Yeshua that was born of, you know, Joseph and Mary. And so th they focus on the physical side, the natural physical side, like, like this is that, that Jesus that, you know, who was, who lived in like Nazareth and stuff like that. How can he claim he came down from heaven? 43, Jesus therefore answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. Of course, this is spiritually. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh or my body, which I give for the life of the world. So he would be speaking about how he will give up himself. He will give up his life. But um, all this is just so ridiculous to the Jews who are listening. And uh, so the Jews therefore quarreled among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Because Jesus would be giving up his life. He, was, he would be giving up his body on the cross. And uh, this stuff is just not making any sense to them. And yeah, 53, Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. 56. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I am him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me, will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. So there's a clear parallel with the manna that's clear from, from early on. Remember earlier about how Moses wrote about me? Remember that? There are all kinds of things you can go into. I, I, I won't have time to even go into many of them. But we know that, you know, all the feasts, they all point to Christ. He's the Passover lamb. He's the one that gets our households, households cleansed of leaven, of sin. Uh, he is the one who rose from the dead on the, uh, the Feast of first fruits. on and on and on. Even manna that Moses recorded, that Moses was involved in, the very manna, it points to Christ. So as I said earlier, how did the manna work? Well, each day, they get their daily food in the wilderness. And, I mean, when it comes to eating food, it's not optional. Just in case you didn't know. When it comes to other things that we do, all kinds of things are optional. You don't have to do it. But when it comes to eating food, you can't live long unless you eat, right? Unless you eat and drink. So manna was an essential thing as they're in the wilderness. When you're in the wilderness, you can't survive, obviously. And so this was God's supernatural provision to live their lives. Well, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And you, you saw like uh, 50, verse 53 and on, he keeps saying, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Just like they had to eat food to survive. Christians, we eat Jesus and we drink his blood. He is our source of life. And uh, he's taking himself as the source of life. 
the spiritual food that sustains us. So he's not an option. Like when you look at look at this, you know, 53 to 58, he keeps saying, unless you eat 53, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. This is not an optional, okay, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you get special reward. No, it's, you don't have any life in you. Just like the manna was essential for survival, for God's people, Jesus is our food and he's our drink. He's what we need to eat and drink to live our lives. He is our spiritual sustenance. So if you're a Christian, one of the evidences that you're a Christian is that Jesus is your daily sustenance. You eat him and you drink him to have spiritual life. He's your daily manna. Just like they in the wilderness had their daily manna to live, to survive in the wilderness. In the new covenant, Jesus is the manna for God's people. We eat him every day. You get that? So he ties those who eat him and drink him to having everlasting life, having salvation. And it's tied to abiding in him, verse 56. So abiding in him, it's done by uh, eating him and drinking him. And uh, I know that um, the Roman Catholic, they absolutely take this passage to be talking about communion. But um, that's likely not the case. Because if you think about it, if it's really that, then you can just take any non-Christian and tell them to come and eat this communion meal, this bread and wine, and get them to have eternal life by eating and drinking that. But it doesn't make any sense. Because Jesus says here, when you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have life in you and you're, you're going to be raised on that day and you're going to live forever. So it doesn't make sense. So with the background of the manna, he would be talking about basically having him as a source of life. And if somebody says, but wait, no, no, wait. Jesus says not only eating his body, but he says drinking his blood. So that must be talking about communion. I mean, think about it. The communion, it's about the bread and the wine. Someone may try to argue that. But the reason why Jesus is probably going into body and blood is when it comes to our sustenance, can we survive with just food? No, water is essential. There is eating and drinking. There's both parts. And so that's probably why, just like uh, John 4 of like the whole water and things like that, Jesus is taking that that way, the whole eating and drinking, the sustaining, the life. So uh, when you are truly born again, he's going to be your source of life, that you need to eat him and drink him. Just like, you know, when I get up in the morning, I always drink water. I'm thirsty every day. Uh, I think you guys also eat and drink too, right? Yeah, if we don't eat and drink, we're, we're dead. And so Jesus is that essential. He's our spiritual food and spiritual drink. So I just would leave you with the question, is Jesus the one you hunger for? The one you thirst for? You need him? He's your spiritual food? Because like I kind of said the other time, when I was a non-Christian, I didn't need him because I was spiritually dead. A dead person doesn't need any food. They don't need any drink. When's the last time you heard a dead body saying, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty? Because when you're dead, there's no need for anything because you're dead. But when you become alive spiritually, you hunger and thirst for him. So then, uh, yeah, 60, therefore many of his disciples, when they heard, when they heard this said, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? So obviously now, even for us, when we hear this, like eating Jesus's body and drinking his blood, it sounds very, uh, like scandalous, very just bad. Like, what is this? Well, the Jews during this time, of course, if anything, it was worse for them. Like, how can he say such grotesque, terrible things of eating flesh and drinking blood, cannibalism? So yeah, hard to accept. 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? Does this cause you to stumble? 
What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he, uh, ascend to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you, they are Spirit and they are life. Again, guys, you know this if you're a Christian, that Jesus' words, they give life. They're life-giving. When you don't have his word, you get hungry and you get empty. I hope there are days where when you don't have much time with him, when you haven't spent time with him, you're empty. Because uh, there are some days where I, I sense that. Just like when you don't eat food, you get hungry, right? You, you have this emptiness. You want to fill that emptiness. Spiritually, it's the same thing. When you don't spend time with Jesus, when you haven't eaten him, when you haven't drunk him, there's this emptiness. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Jesus' words are life-giving. And uh, one of the ways we know that we have spiritual life is there's emptiness that comes when we have not been in his word for some time. Just like if it's been some time since we ate food and drunk water, there's emptiness. So, And the more you're alive, the more you will be able to sense hunger. If a person is more dying, they don't really sense hunger and you know stuff as much. But the more you're alive, the more you can sense that. So spiritually, it's the same way. The more you're spiritually alive, the more if you go a day, if you even go many hours without Jesus's food, uh, his word, then you get empty. There's, you feel emptiness. And but unfortunately, 64. But there are some of you who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. So there's that thing of um, just God is the one that grants those, grants the coming to him, believing in Jesus. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, you don't, you don't want to go away also, do you? But Simon Peter said, Lord. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. So, unfortunately, many disciples who followed Jesus, they went back and walked with him no more. They left him. Jesus' teachings were too offensive. They couldn't take it. And they left. And so, he said to the twelve, Do you want to go away also? But... Peter's response is, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So when you have spiritual life yourself, just from reading the words of Jesus, you can sense spiritual life, that this is real stuff. It feeds your soul. So Peter, uh, he, he knew that Jesus' words were life-giving and real. And, and yeah, 70, Jesus answered them, did I not choose you the 12 and one of you is uh, the devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. So, yeah, just something on the side that's kind of important is just how Jesus never hesitated to speak harsh words, but sometimes they're necessary. Uh, many today, if they saw this, if they heard this, they would think, man, Jesus is pretty harsh. Like, one of you is the devil, or like his offensive teaching about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. But something that you see all throughout the Bible is with all the prophets and Jesus, they never back down on the truth. They never compromise. If they need to speak the truth, they'll speak it. Now, there is a need to kind of, de depending on the audience and things like that, you know, speak in a gentle way, whatever. But there are times where it's just necessary to speak truth firmly. So, yeah. Um, any thoughts, questions? This. So... <clears throat> Like, look at this. The very Moses, remember Jesus said in John 5, the, the very Moses that you hope in, he's going to accuse you because he wrote about me. Well, let's think about just the journey of Moses real quick and the, the uh, whole exodus and everything. God called Moses to go to Egypt to save his people from slavery under Pharaoh, to save them out and lead them into the promised land. That was the mission. Did you hear that? And so Moses goes over there, supernatural signs and wonders, 
that backs him up, that God really sent him. And then he saves God's people out of slavery under Pharaoh, brings them out, and they travel in the wilderness. And then they go into the promised land. In the new covenant, there's a greater Moses raised up. God calls a greater Moses, Jesus the Christ, and he is sent into the world to save God's people, God's elect. They are in bondage. They are slaves of sin. That's going to come up in John 8. They're slaves of sin. They're under the power, the dominion of the devil, Pharaoh. But Jesus saves them out from under that bondage, out of the world, out of Egypt, out of the world, and leads them into the wilderness. And that's where Christians are now. We're in the wilderness and we're headed towards the promised land. But while in the wilderness, just like Israel got daily manna, while Christians are journeying in this life, they get their spiritual food, their manna, Jesus, who's the bread. And just like how Israel daily had their manna, their daily food, Christians, while they're journeying in the wilderness, until they reach the promised land, they have their daily sustenance, Jesus. They eat him as their daily food, their source of life. So all these incredible, amazing truths are just mind boggling. And this is just one part of many, many, many th different things. Uh, just, you know, people can't make this up. I mean, this is history and it's just the amazing uh, setup of God and his way. So unless there are questions or anything, I'll pray. And, uh, Lord, how amazing your word and truth is, Lord. Uh, it's just, it's just too much. It's just, there's so much. How, uh, with all this history, all these truths, the connections, uh, your word is truly uh, amazing in its life. Lord, um, I pray that many, even uh, Jewish uh, lost souls, would come to know that everything in their Bible pointed to Christ, Yeshua, the Messiah, that everything just pointed to you, like it says right here, Moses, the manna, the rock, and on and on. Thank you for your word, thank you for this time, and may you be our manna, may you be our daily bread. If there's anyone that doesn't have you as their daily bread, may you become their daily bread. The bread that was sent from God from heaven to give life to the world so that we eat you and drink you and have life. In Jesus' name, amen.